Can you see my screen? Okay, yeah, so good. today, uh, actually you guys kind of a uh, guinea pig for me for the uh, Padlet. So we are trying to use this one for the uh, boot camp. So I thought let's try it today with your groups, then we can kind of see how it's work. Uh, so if you have any question or any feedback, let's use this one and you can share with that. The reason is uh, because we have few participants who are joining virtually for the bootcamp, but they have to have a kind of space to share the concern virtually because we have some poster board in person, but we don't have that facility for others. So we are planning to use like Padlet time to time when we have a big group meetings. So please try to use it and let me know what you feel. Uh, just it is for experiment purposes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And as similar to every other meeting, I would highly encourage you to have your video switch on and have your agenda just to have the names that then you know this, who are the speakers are today. And please note that we have several stages of training. That's mean postdoc and some are technician and some are graduate student and some are undergrad. So when you're commenting, please be nice to them because expertise level and the, their research are so different. So please be mind that. And also please allow every voice to heard. And as far as you can, please mute the phone and then the speakers will get not disturbed. And before we starting, I would like to welcome a few members to our PPRI family. So I'm starting with Dr. Amanda. Can you please quickly share where you are from and something about you? Sure. Hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Amanda Stalky. I finished my PhD last April and have been working as a postdoc with Anna Childers and the USDA Agricultural Research Service uh, for about a year. The LOCUS project, BPRI, is one of my focal projects, along with a few other genome assemblies of agricultural concern, like I think we drop her a little while. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. At Hi, Amanda. It's a good blocking picture, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so why she joined back? Okay, I will go. Okay, she's back. Oh no, not yet. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Where did you lose me? <laughs> we lose you when you joined the USD, <laughs> USDA. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so I said uh, the LOCUS and BPRI are one of my focal projects. Um, I work on genome assembly of agriculturally relevant insects, including biocontrol agents, pests of maize, and cereal products, and honeybees, um, and I'm a computational biologist by training. Uh, my background is in uh, genomics of management concerns. So I've worked on Tasmanian devils and transmissible cancer and uh, these biocontrol agents. Uh, I live in Western Colorado. I work totally remotely. So I really appreciate the opportunity to interact even by Zoom and uh, I am a big outdoors person. So that's usually where I am when I'm not at the computer. That is all. Thank you, Amanda. So I will ask Gil, can you please quickly share something about you and which lab you are working with? Sure. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Gil. I work in Fabrizio's lab at uh, Fabrizio Gaviani at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I'm doing locust electrophysiology. I'm actually running an experiment right now uh, <laughs> uh, doing uh, 
direct and indirect recordings from this huge neuron in the eye, the LGMD, the lobula giant uh, motion detector, I think uh, the, the acronym. Uh, yeah, so mostly electrophysiology, uh, hopefully can get into a little bit of genetics, a little bit of behavior, something I'm interested in learning about a little more at the BPRI. Uh, when I'm not, uh, not in lab, uh, I'm often just sitting on my balcony, looking at my plants and watching the people go by. <laughs> that is cool. So David, it is a kind of on-spot request. Can you please uh, share kind of a little introduction about you yourself too? Yeah, so um, my name is David. I also go to Baylor College of Medicine and I also just recently joined Dr. Gabbiani's lab and I'll be working closely as well with uh, Dr. Zong's lab. Um, I am in the computational uh, and quantitative biosciences program. So I do mostly like bioinformatics sort of work, but um, I also do have a lot of uh, previous wet lab experience. So I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty in that sense. Um, so yeah, then hobbies include things like tennis, soccer, um, playing the piano, I don't know, stuff like that, I guess. And cooking. I'm a pretty good cook, I would say, especially for a guy. <laughs> so I just want to introduce Lisa. She's also a good tennis player from the Barani Slab. Maybe she will hear us, maybe not. So uh, just going to the presentation, who are going to like to go first? Can I ask Kelly? Yes, I can go okay. first. Uh, so this first poll will be sharing my screen. I think you will be able to. You guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. You see my mouse moving? Perfect. So, uh, Tanya, I'm sorry, this presentation, like my slide is a little bit long, so I may pass 10 minute mark a little bit. Just because you said that um, I need to elaborate more about the background and make sure everybody will understand what I'm talking about. So it's a little bit long, so everyone stay with me. All right. Okay, so my, I mean, our lab project was to apply CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing tool to uh, Sister Circa Americana. Uh, and Okay, so a little bit background information is uh, what is CRISPR? So CRISPR um, is a great tool to modify the genome in uh, any organisms to study the host phenotype and what their changes in after we change it. Uh, if it's applied to grasshopper, the CRISPR allow us to uh, study their swarming behavior, which is one of our focus in the lab, and potentially in the future can change it by knock out uh, the death behavior. However, the problem is there are very few study right now that actually successfully use CRISPR-Cas9 on the grasshopper. Uh, so therefore, our lab goal and aims is to use CRISPR uh, to knock out some genes uh, and to study uh, how what is the effect of the knocking out on their behavior. So how CRISPR actually work. So the picture to the left of you, uh, you can see here as uh, you can see the ping here is the guy RNA. So every CRISPR mechanism start with the guy RNA. And then you have the Cas9 protein accompany the guy to form the complex. And this complex, uh, step two, will bind to the DNA of interest. And the way that it's bind is the guy RNA will bind to the complementary, uh, one of the complementary strain of a DNA 
of the host genome. And after binding, the complex will introduce a double strain break or cutting side, uh, cutting across the uh, DNA uh, that eventually, if you have the donor plasmid or any foreign DNA that you want to integrate in, it will go in and fill in the gap. Uh, that's how principles work. So basing on our, this principle at the picture to the right of you, uh, two events will happen. Either you will insert or delete uh, partially the gene of your host, and that is called non-homologous end joining, NHEJ, or if you have a, bone, a donor plasmid or donor integration uh, DNA nearby, the homology directed repair mechanism will happen as the donor blue uh, region right here will be introducing to the host genome. And we have a new gene inserted in the host genome. So both of these mechanisms can happen at the same time uh, in the same organism. So uh, our study in the lab is just want to see what is the frequency of NXEJ or what is the frequency of the HDR event happen in grasshopper. And after we figure it out the frequency, we will developing the like we will make it more efficient. The main goal is to do the HDR. We mainly focus on the HDR more than the NXEJ. But before applying the CRISPR on the grasshopper, uh, we need a sort of an animal that to bridge the gap. The gap here, I mean, uh, it initially our lab only focus on Drosophila melanogaster, one of the model organisms to study genomes. And we successfully uh, do knockout and knock in uh, some of the genes in Drosophila melanogaster. And we haven't done in any organism beside the melanogaster. So if we jump directly in the Cystocerca americana, this would be a huge gap. And there's so many variant uh, like the promoter and um, like what type of uh, gene that we looking at is still unknown. So therefore we have to use sort of an animal that's far related to Drosophila melanogaster, but also not related to uh, Cytocircle Americana, just to test whether our CRISPR work on uh, other organism, organism beside melanogaster or not. And that uh, animal we choose is Drosophila virilis. So Drosophila virilis is um, a species that diverged from the main side of Drosophila around 40 years ago. So it's quite far uh, related to Drosophila melanogaster. So we want to test this animal to see if CRISPR actually work on virilis or not. So uh, there's some of the essential component of a successful CRISPR Cas9 event that tests in our lab. Uh, there are three components. The first one is a donor. The donor is the new DNA or the foreign DNA that you want to introduce into your host. Uh, and this donor can be, and the best form of it is, is in DNA plasma. Uh, you also need a Cas9 enzyme because it's CRISPR-Cas9. And this Cas9 can either in the form of DNA or protein. Uh, you can also use some in vitro transcribed RNA. Uh, we have never tested. The only, the only method we test is DNA or protein. And the final component is, of course, the single guy RNA. And this can be either in DNA plasmid form or in vitro transcribed RNA or it's pure form. So this is the overall CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism uh, that developed in our lab. So at the top here, you have the DNA of the host genome. And um, on the, like this plasmid right here is, is the integration cassette. And flanked by the integration cassette is the left homology arm and the right homology arm. So when CRISPR, when CRISPR Cas9 event happened, the exchange between the host DNA from exon one to exon four 
will be replaced by whatever you have between the left homology arm and the right homology arm. So the final products you can see at the bottom is you still have five prime UTR of the host and then the integration cassette that included in the plasmid. Um, so first we try to do one of the control where we inject our uh, model organism in the lab, Drosophila melanogaster embryos with the plasmid component. So we introduce on the left is the integration cassette and on the right is plasmid right here is the um, Cas9 and single guy RNA component of, of the uh, main three component that I just presented to you two slides before. So we choose the yellow gene uh, of the melanogaster. So choosing the gene of the, uh, the model organism is also important because we, we, have, we want to choose this gene because if this gene is knocked out, we can see a change in color from gray, black to like pure yellow, like you can see uh, in this picture here. So uh, the Cas9 and Guy RNA complex will introduce a cut between exon one at the beginning of exon one and at the end of exon two. So the entire uh, yellow gene uh, exon will be excited and be replaced by the 3XP3 single folded GFP SV40 green marker. So this gene uh, right here, you see at the bottom, our integration donor will uh, make the animal eyes green fluorescent. As you can see in the picture at the far right corner here, that if you view it under um, green tag fluorescent microscope, you will see uh, that in the middle of the eyes, it will be green fluorescent, like you cannot miss it. So that's why we know that the yellow gene is completely get rid of by uh, our Cas9 single guy RNA complex. Uh, one of the alternative is we can also inject the Cas9 protein uh, and single guy RNA as an RNA form into the Drosophila virilis. Uh, the bridge model between Melanogaster and Cystocerca americana. The reason why we inject uh, the Cas9 as in the enzyme form and the single guy RNA, guy RNAs in their RNAs form, but not in uh, uh, DNA form, is because we can, like, in order for, so in order for the Cas9 to be expressed in the whole genome. Is has the promoter called HSP70, and this promoter is not conserved across species. Uh, by that I mean it may work in some species, but not work for the others. So with the um, Sister Circa Americana, which never tested before, we want to use something that in pure form is 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 not depending on the host translational or transcription uh, machinery. It just, after we inject the Cas9 enzyme and the single guy RNA will form a complex immediately and start to cut the host genome without have to be transcribed and translate by the host machinery. So I'm again- Sorry, Caroline, we have to, only one minute left. Okay, okay. almost done, almost one, one more slide, I promise. Um, yeah, so we also choose the yellow gene uh, in, uh, virulus and the Cas9 and single guy RNA cut at the beginning and the end and exchange uh, with the 3XP3 neon green uh, green visual marker. And what our data show is you can see on the right. So the top right is uh, the white type. And after the injection, you can see that there's a change in color from black to yellow. Also, you can see that the green fluorescent in the middle of the eyes, suggesting that the entire uh, genome, uh, yellow genes, be completely knocked out, uh, which show the success. So we're gonna apply the same principle and mechanism into the um, 
Sister Circle Americana. And we hope that same event will be happen. If you can see, well, because we don't, I don't have it yet. So I just hope that we have the green fluorescent uh, Sister Circle Americana after we inject this complex into uh, this animal. Okay, that's it for my uh, presentation. Do you guys have any question? Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you very much. It's a great presentation. So any comments or feedback or any suggestions or any? Oh, sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. we have only two minutes, so you have to be a little bit rushed. Yes. I have a few questions. <laughs> yes, go ahead. OK, so uh, first, like bigger picture, what do you plan to um, what will be the uh, what are you inserting? Do you know yet? Yeah, yeah. So this is sort of what we going to be inserting. So we mainly gonna insert something that we can visually uh, examine after we inject. And one of the uh, component that being tested successfully and consistently in the lab is the three XP three neon green uh, visual marker, which gonna make the eye of the transgenic animal become green uh, when we when you view it under the fluorescent micros microscope. But that doesn't help us understand like the phenology plasticity thing. Like how are you addressing the plasticity stuff? Yes, so the two part of our uh, study. The first part is to test whether this CRISPR-Cas9 even work in grasshopper. Now, if it's work, then we're going to target the gene that we believe cause warming behavior. We're gonna knock out that gene by using uh, the exchange cassette. So let's say gene A let, is believed to cause uh, swarming behavior. Uh, we're going to just target that gene and knock out that gene. And then we uh, examine the behavior after the knockout to see the effect. So this is the very beginning of to study. Thank you, Kelvin. I'm sorry that we cannot answer any question because we have another uh, trainee's presentation as well as leadership, uh, PPRI Leadership Council discussion. So let's go to Maeva. Sure. Uh, I think you will be able to share. Yes. Of course, now it disappeared. I apologize. The second is always difficult with this. Uh, yeah. And here. All right. Please let me know if you see it in presenter mode or in normal mode. Presenter. Oh, damn it. Normal, normal. Sorry. Normal. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So it's good. All right, uh, so you don't see the timer or anything. No, like. no, no. Okay, perfect. All right, if it's all right, I'll start. Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Maeva and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Texas A&M. I work as part of the uh, Hojong Songs Lab. And today I'm going to present you a bit about what I have been doing and especially what I plan to do in the future as part of the BPRI and how I'm trying to take advantage of locus as I, what believe is a real case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And so if you're not familiar with the story, is this transition between this shy, docile individual that became this evil and dangerous looking one. And I think, you know, this picture actually really uh, illustrated very nicely, thanks to our student, Brendan Hu, with the two phases of desert locusts, with the solitary and the gregarious, which are the two I'm going to talk about uh, today. And the reason I'm looking at this transition is because we have still some um, misunderstanding on how those transition is, these transitions are happening, and especially what kind of secret are lying in the gene, in the gene expression during the course of this transition. So I am an evolutionary biologist, and you know, 
I am always amazed by the profusion of life that there is around us and how much diverse form you have. And it's known that actually nature has evolved in such a way that you have organisms that demonstrate high phenotypic plasticity, where a single genome can produce very striking and different uh, phenotype, right? And so I just showed you a few examples on this slide, uh, including some I worked in the past bees, where it's simply like you feed royal jelly to a larvae and it will become a long-lived queen that will reproduce well if you do not feed that as much to a worker it'll be short-lived and just work until death and you have other organism right the arctic fox changing depending on season other insect change and show remarkable anatomical feature just in response to resources and so does locust and what is quite surprising is that locusts have this gregarious like phase. And this is kind of a teaser of your meeting here coming at boot camp where you'll see our colony, which are just crazy. As soon as you give them food, they're just conspicuous. They attract to each other and they will like eat as much as you give them. And then, so you can actually rear them in very high concentration in the lab. And as soon as they are like in high density, they show this behavior and this color. And as, as soon as you isolate them or put them in small, condition, they will turn from the black to actually this green and shy individual that moves slow. You could see it was on my finger. It didn't fly. It didn't try to move too much. And basically, it just hides and eats just what it needs all day. And if you were to put this individual in a crowded, actually, in the beginning, you can almost feel like they cry for help. They're just like, oh, my God, what's happening? But over time, they start to be part of the group and they can actually revert to the gregarious phase. And this can all occur in one generation. So that's pretty amazing, but it's quite impressive that we still don't really understand how this change in terms of gene expression. So the bulk of the work that has been done is actually from Song Lab by Bert Fouquet. And what they show is like from the same genome, you do have during the solitary individual going to high density, which we call gregarization, um, a different path of different genes are expressed compared to when you go from crowded to solitarized. But at the same time, one species will show some type of, of changes, but another locust will show a different, a different change. So although they adopt the same strategy, it's not seemingly that the genes involved are exactly the same. But one of the issue with these studies is that this was done on bulk tissue, that which was done on head and thorax, and they were also only targeting the endpoint. So they were looking at gregarious individual and solitary, which mean that in the course of uh, the transition, what they observe is the endpoint. So imagine, you know, the whole process of transiting as a machinery piece with each gear being a gene and whether this gene will be upregulated or downregulated will change the whole locus behavior and phenotype in the end. But if we were to look at this transition, and this is where my work intervened, we look at this transition from the very, very early stage. Let's take a solitary individual and we put it in a crowded with 500 to 1,000 individual and take this individual, sample it every 30 minutes, hour, and so on until to 72 hours. Maybe we can retrace this cascading process and find what was the upstream, upstream gene that started. Not only that, we can also look at where this gene was activated in which tissue. Was it smelling other, touching other, seeing other? We can actually do that. But for doing this, we actually need to also target some tissue specific, not only taking the head or the thorax. We decided to look and train as a team. And this work is actually done also with Elisa and Vivian who are on the call. And uh, we target last ninfal instar because they are still like plastic. And we look at the brain where we can have a sense of vision, processing of information, smell, metathoracic ganglia, which is involved into the touching. And then you have mouth part for gustatory and guts. But also we are taking all the tissue because we know that at some point other teams from here might want to use it for other projects. 
And on the quest to find the master switch of this transition, the experimental design is that we want to do for each species, taking a solitary that has been rare for at least two generations uh, in isolation and crowded and take every 10 different time points, 10 individual, and do the same on the opposite side, which means that per species will have about 200 individual process. And if you count each tissue, that's about 1,600 tissue that are dissected. But of course, we're not going to sequence all of this. We'll sequence about 250 or 200 per, um, per condition density treatment per species. And we'll do that with Illumina sequencing and rna -C. So we are still in the process of producing this individual, and this is something that will take probably the next couple of years. And our hope is that we come from this image, which is not something I'm trying to make you understand, but complex picture with gene interacting to each other to maybe having, oh, this is some genes that are interesting. And we can use this gene, for example, with the presentation just presented before and knocking down and see what happened. So that's it for me, and I am happy to welcome your question. Thank you, Maeva. Thank you very much. So any questions? I've got a question. Um, for those for these illustrations, which exact uh, Schistocircus species did you use? For which the ones with the very marked coloring differences? The, the which one? The one with the marked color differences? Yeah, like during during the video. For oh, this this is Gregaria. Okay. This is uh yeah, this is Gregaria that you see, and solitary in green, and crowded just in uh, in yellow. So we mark them because we uh, make different time, and it's it's adopted from bees. It's easy to spot them in a crowded cage, um, and it worked well. Gotcha. Um, and I, sorry, I'm a little bit of a, at a novice at grasshopper biology, um, but uh, from one of the figures you were showing it, it made it look like the uh, phase change from solitary to gregarious takes three years. Is that correct? Or um, I thought it was a more like short term process, at least in Schistocirca americana, which is the one we have in uh, the Gabbiani lab, right? No, I think I think it's not written, but uh, we can we can surely revise the slide. But I don't. Oh, that's the long term density treatment. Is like uh, it's that means that they have been over three years uh, in colony. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we use this colony to produce both the crowded and the isolated. And you can yeah in a matter of one generation already get isolated. Sorry for the confusion. No worries. Thank you. So because of the time, I will asking everybody, if you have a question, use the Padlet and put under the, each presenter's name, then they can reply to the each one by commenting. And let's go to the Odilia and ask Odilia to share her research work with us. Um, wait a second. Uh, how can I share my screen, share screen? Yes. Okay. Sure. Can you see my screen? So hi everyone, or should I say howdy? Then now I live in Texas. I've been living here for nine months. It's crazy. As you can hear, I have a French accent. I'm from Switzerland. Uh, I'm doing my PhD in Dr. Sword Lab. Uh, so this year I've been working on two projects. Uh, one concerning the collective movement of locus and the other one on the individual behavioral phase change. So for the first project, uh, we built two arenas, uh, as you can see on the right picture, uh, where I put different population densities, that is to say 5, 25, 50, 75, 100, and 125 individual per arena. And I did five replicates of each density. Um, so experiences were carried out with the crowded Schistocirca americana and crowded uh, Gregaria uh, with fourth instars. So each I recorded each trial uh, with cameras, and um, actually you cannot see them on the picture because they are right under the white sheet. So 
in this slide, you might better understand the study design. So the columns represent the different densities of the two species and the rows indicate the number of the replicates. So it took almost five months to do it because as you all know, it's a challenge to keep a constant large pools of different individuals. So it took me quite some time. So to analyze the collective movement, uh, to determine when they started to march, if they marched, uh, and depending on the density, sometimes they would march like at 50 individuals, but then they would stop marching and after a few hours they would like start again. So I'm using a software called uh, Trex, uh, which was developed by Jan, Jan Kuzen, uh, which I was actually visit this summer uh, in Germany. I'm going uh, for two weeks there. And we also possess data for uh, Pisciferans from Dr. Song. So the data, data analysis is still in, in process. Uh, this semester has been quite hectic for me, so I could not allow as much time as I wanted to my research, unfortunately. But now that the semester is over, I will be back on track. So the second project is actually ongoing. I will start with the dry run next week. I've been postponing it for so long, but yeah, it's been difficult. Um, it's, it's going to happen always in the same experimental room, but uh, with a different arena, as you can see on the picture on the right. So I will this time work with uh, last instars uh, of Gregaria only and not Americana, because we already possess some data for the other species. So in the middle of the arena, I will put place a uh, one locus, uh, either from a solitary line or from a crowded line, and I will track its movement uh, with either the track software or maybe ethovision, depending on how it, how it works. Um, and on one side of the rectangular uh, arena, I will place 50 gregarious individuals, uh, while on the other side, so here on the left, uh, it will remain empty. So the experimental locust in the middle will be able to see other locusts, and it will be able to smell them, as they are only separated by a glass with holes. And finally, I started another project uh, in November with my colleague and friend Andy. And Demeter, who also works um, with uh, Dr. Sword, but she works on following worms. And if we are successful, she will be able to transpose this method to follow me worms. So we called it the Raman project, but unfortunately it has nothing to do with the noodles. Um, it's much more complicated. Uh, it uses the Raman spectrometer, which is a technique emitting light that goes through the sample of interest, and then it will be reflected uh, in a very, very complex way. Uh, I asked my colleague working on the Raman spectrometry engine, and it took me, it takes about a year to train people to use the device. So I won't pretend and say, I know how it works. I just know we get the data, the numbers, and I'm doing stats on the numbers. So then they gave us actually numbers and a spectrograph that I will show you uh, right after. So we actually use the hemolymph from uh, adult Americana, adult Gregaria, adult Pisciferans, males and females, uh, crowded and isolated lines. Uh, we actually managed not to cut their legs, which is great because we don't want to damage the individuals. And uh, we found a way to keep them intact. So actually we just sampled them uh, with a needle um, underneath the second uh, abdominal segment. And the sample were sent to the bio bio building here at Texas A&M University. And here you can see it closer. It's a bit ugly, I'm sorry. The picture is a blur. So we receive uh, numbers, a lot, a lot of numbers that we analyze. So um, long story short, actually, the columns are the peaks. So some peaks are actually more important than others. As you can see here, we have like different amplitudes, but they are all all the species differs in amplitude for the same peak. So we analyze the peaks and same for the sexes and same for the rearing conditions. And then we make stats about the, the amplitude differences. So we analyze it and I just submitted yesterday for my last assignment for the R class that I took uh, my results. I was working on this multivariate data set. So species actually clustered pretty well, as you can see on the graph. Uh, it clustered more than sex and more than rearing condition. So in a nutshell, it's promising results, I, I think. And it might convince the authorities to use nowadays um, the Raman spectroscopy, because now it's quite expensive to have pocket ones, to have like small ones. The one we use is actually 
it's massive, it takes a whole room, but there are portable ramen that exist, but they are like really expensive. So if you get to, if you, if you can give like the government more data, they will maybe finance them and maybe make them more affordable because um, the goal actually is to take those in the field, to be able to take a random uh, specimen, take a bit of, of, of blood, put it in the device and then get quick results uh, of the specimen ID to know if like which species it is and if there are risk of like a swarm event or not. And this will be quicker than uh, genetic assays. So we are currently sampling through um, various life stages. So we are doing experiments with Andy on six instars and also on, on adults. And uh, we also did an experiment. We, we are going to receive the, the data. So we are going to analyze them but we collected hemonym from locusts uh, under different diets because we were afraid that the, um, the Brahman would actually detect the carotenoids present in the diet. So it would just eliminate the potential interference of the gut content. So that's it. I'm sorry, I think I speak a bit fast. It's even worse in French, but uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to chat with you. And sorry for my, I, I was late. I had a car issue, my car broke down. I had a meltdown, but that's okay now. That's fine. Any feedback or questions you can add into the Padlet too, but we can have two or three questions now. Yeah, uh, the tracking software that you're using, is that Deep Lab Cut? Uh, no, it's called Trex. Okay. Like dinosaur. <laughs> And it was, it was made by Jan Cousin, who lives in uh, Germany. He works at the um, Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior. And it's quite new. He released a paper on how to use it. I'm still playing with it. But I think I will need to have a call with him to just master the, the software. Cool. But it's cool because you can track insects and you don't need a tag. And you can track like all the movement during six hours and it works perfectly fine. You can find videos online. He tracked zebras, and you can also see the tail moving. It's quite accurate. Cool. So, could you use it in the field? The yeah, I think if you get if you get good quality uh, videos, yeah, yeah, and it's quite easy to to install the software on the on the computer. So. So I actually had a question. So you're storing your hemolymph at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, so yeah. if, you, if you're supposed to do work this in the field, uh, is that your plan yeah. is to keep the hemolymph at minus 80? And no. then yeah, yeah, good question. No, actually, so we put it in the minus 80 degrees because the quarantine facility is like 15, maybe 20 minutes far away from the building where we analyze them. And so as we don't own the Raman spectrometer, we cannot like pop up at uh, Nico's office uh, every five minutes and say, hey, here is a sample. But if you use a portable device on the field, you will actually be able to put it directly in the device. It's just for a matter of storing everything and then giving uh, our colleague like maybe 100 samples at the same time. And not every day, like every five minutes, another sample. Okay. And also thanks to Maeva, who is working also at Texas a uh, She gave us a lot of hemolym sample of her dissection. So thank you, Maeva, for your donation. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't think the grasshopper is as happy as me to give you the Emily. <laughs> they maybe happier with me. I don't care then. <laughs> OK, thank you. If you have additional question, please feel free to add into there. Now I see that Maeva get a lot of questions, so she's answering in there. So happy to see how trainees are interacting with each other. So allow me to share the Elisa's uh, video. So if you have any question, please feel free to add in here. I believe she may be able to join or may not be able to join because she ha she have a meeting. It's supposed to finish by 4.30, but I'm not sure. So allow me to share it.
Hi, my name is Alyssa, and I'm a PhD student in Dr. Song's lab at Texas A&M University. For our BPRI research activity, Maiva, Vivian, and I are doing tissue-specific time course transcriptome analysis for each of the six Schistocerca species. With this experiment, we aim to determine which genes are differentially expressed during the process of solitarization and gregorization in both locust and non-swarming species. Uh, for this experiment, we rear second generation solitary individuals, each in their own cage to prevent visual, olfactory, and tactile stimuli from uh, the other grasshoppers. Three days after they become six instars, we mark them with different color combinations using uh, Posca markers so we know uh, who's who. We then put them in a crowded cage for different periods of time. This could be half an hour, one hour, two hours, four, eight, 12, 48, or 72 hours. Um, once their time's up, Maiva dissects the individual and obtains the metathoracic ganglia, optical lobes, and brain, among other parts. Uh, we do a similar thing with the gregarious individuals. Crowded weird grasshoppers are isolated for different periods of time and are then dissected. We will uh, eventually do RNA extractions and RNA sequencing to see which genes are differentially expressed in different tissues at different time points. So in this video, we have the solitary reared individuals in a crowded cage. Another project I'm working on involves Pisifrons and Cerealis cubans. These closely related species can hybridize to produce viable offspring in a lab setting and experience different degrees of plasticity. Pisifrons is more locust-like and cubans is more grasshopper-like. Uh, this experiment will use quantitative trait loci or QTL analysis to uncover the molecular basis of locust phase polyphenism in these species. QTL analysis is a statistical method that links quantified phenotypic data with genotypic data. Uh, some former students performed a crossing experiment to produce uh, backcross hybrids with either 75% or 25% of the Pisifrons genome. The variation generated by backcrossing shows up as single nucleotide polymorphism markers, or SNPs, which represent our genotypic data. The individuals were then reared in either crowded or isolated conditions. Behavior, color, and morphology have been uh, quantified for all hybrids, and this represents our uh, phenotypic data. The next steps for this project involve DNA extractions um, from the preserved femurs that we have. Um, we will then perform RAD sequencing to obtain SNPs. We will uh, construct linkage maps to the, show the position of SNPs relative to each other in terms of recombination frequency. Um, we'll anchor the reference genome to the linkage map and then perform QTL analysis to narrow down our search for candidate genes. If there are any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me either uh, through email or Teams or I'm sure uh, Tanya has already set up a way for you to contact me. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you. I hope that everyone hear the presentation correctly. And if you have a question, please feel free to add into the presentation, the, the Padlet, then I will share with her and she can answer the question when she joins the next meeting or you guys meet at the bootcamp, hopefully. Uh, so going forward with the next one, uh, please uh, allow me to introduce our leadership 
uh, trainee leadership council members, there are a one member representing East University for the BPRI. So they are going to discuss about uh, a session that we are going to do during the boot camp. So during the boot camp, we have one hour session that allocated for trainee, giving them a chance to communicate with the faculty about their concern. It can be anything, so you guys can decide. So leadership uh, uh, council members will share more thought about their plan because I already share some kind of ideas what we can do. So please feel free to share your ideas with them. So can I ask Doris, my, my uh, Vivian, Alexis is not there. Can someone initiate the discussion? about your plans? I actually had a question about that session. Like, do we know which faculties are gonna participate? Like, what, what would be the format? Like, So the, the question is, you can decide the format. So what we are trying to do is give you an opportunity, like every faculty members can answer your question. It can be professional development, it can be related to research, it can be related to BPRI, anything that you feel that you need a response from the faculty members of BPRI, including our postdocs, as well as me, anyone who do you think that we need to discuss. For example, you can say that we don't need professional level, let's discuss about the phenotypic plastic. You can have that kind of discussion. Or you can say that, okay, this is my PhD, I'm going to finish, what the next step? Can faculty advise me? That kind of thing. That is just examples that I'm sharing. So you can decide what you like to do, but you have one hour whole session that you can plan and you can organize and you can decide the format. Yeah, so we were thinking that we would uh, check with the trainees um, and see what kind of format they prefer, uh, whether they would like to send their questions ahead. And we just uh, ask those questions while we are in the, while we're hosting the session because I think that would be easier or we can just ask them at that time um, while we are conducting the session that what questions there are. But I was thinking it would be more helpful if people would just uh, send out their questions ahead of time. Uh, and then we can just ask those questions to the faculty. But whatever the trainees would like, that is what we would go with. Yes, I was um, thinking um, the same as well. I'm sorry for you. Right, I don't know. We should do like a panel style maybe with all the uh, faculty or even like just like a big group we're just together kind of like having like a conversation but the leadership committee can all have maybe like different based on all the questions that we collect from everybody have maybe like different topics like for example like oh i have a sheet and all the questions on my sheet are related to professional development somebody else to research somebody else to life after phd and things like that and we just kind of cycle through and maybe have like a little open talk at the end, like a five, 10 minutes just to like openly talk or something like that. But th that's kind of like how I imagined it. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I missed it. Uh, what exactly is this session? Can can someone summarize it? What, what's, what are we talking about? Okay, so I think because you joined it a little bit late, the initial communication was already gone. <laughs> Sorry about that. So during the boot camp, if you see the pro program agenda, there is a one hour session that trainee can ask questions from the faculty. So this is uh, this discussion is related to that and figuring out what kind of format better for you guys, because that is completely depend on you and we don't like to intervene you. So we like to go with your suggestion. We're giving one hour, and if you want some additional like a logistic arrangement, that can be also done. Also, if I can speak from the postdoc perspective, we are only two postdocs really in the trainees. So I feel like it really should be driven by the graduate students' needs first. And we are happy to, you know, support you in building it, but this should benefit first to you because we can we, we are in minority right now and and uh, I think it's you know you are all at different stage of PhD it's the right time to ask postdocs um, we have also I think a assistant research assistant and we have Tanya education we have research coordinator and and PI so that's the perfect time to ask a bit all of their perspective if for example you want to go to academia 
So uh, Tanya, uh, should we just, what I was thinking is that we, after consulting with all the other leadership council, we would uh, send out a uh, question, like an email asking the trainees to submit their questions and then collect those questions. And then uh, like, uh, and then just go with that or unless, I mean, you have a different suggestion. I think that is what uh, at least we as leadership council were planning on doing. I don't have a specific suggestion. Anything that you guys uh, decide, I'm fine with that, but make sure that it is one hour session and you can get best from the faculties. Okay. For example, I would say from, uh, you guys can contact Maeva and Amanda and ask what they missed during their PhD that they would have known that time. Then you can add that kind of question to your uh, question list, then you can get it because once time's gone, you miss the chance. Mm -hmm. Also, I would suggest that maybe everyone think uh, compared to a normal PhD where you're in a single lab, you guys are benefiting a network um, with cross institution, you know, it's a great perspective, but at the same time, it can be overwhelming. And so you should also try to, this is only a suggestion, right, of course, but maybe see how you can take as much as possible opportunity right now of this network. And if this can be, you know, what it is to be a integration biologist, uh, how to network or stuff like this, this seems very rudimentary, but that's the perfect time to actually ask those questions. Uh, but again, it's completely up to you. And, you know, I just will give suggestion, but it's up to you. Any ideas from Doris? We need to hear your voice too. Um, given what Mavis suggested, I think it might be helpful that uh, you provide some questions like what do you think we should know and what we should ask or you know. Yeah, Hello? I mean, you mean from me or from Tanya? Oh, from, from you, Mavis. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can um, give you some example of question, but it's mostly depending on what you guys want to do in the future, right? It's, uh, I cannot decide for you. I can just give you like, for example, if you guys decide to go for a topic, which is what should I know <laughs> at the end of my PhD, I can maybe probably uh, propose with uh, Amanda say, oh, you know, what I would have liked to know is that, and then you guys can decide the question, but I do not want to impose what I believe is important compared to what you need uh, and consider is important. Oh, no, I, I understand that. I was just suggesting because we, at least I don't know what I don't know. And so clearly you have more experience in this field uh, in terms of like professional development and things like that. So what questions did you wish you asked, uh, asked before you started your postdoc, for example? Well, if you if you guys make a document, I can potentially uh, come up with some question, and then you guys pick up in it. <laughs> that will, I will be happy to help with that, of course, obviously. Or you can even ask that as a question during the panel, and then <laughs> if my answer is wrong regarding all of the people's perspective or experience, they can weigh in. You know. <laughs> Okay, so and we I can guess... share a document uh, with everyone and uh, everybody can ask whatever questions the trainees, I think that would be easier. So I like my, my suggestion that uh, maybe we should just start a document. Uh, trainees can put in their questions that they want answered. And uh, in this way, we have questions ahead of time and then we can post that to the council while during the bootcamp. And yeah, I mean, we can uh, send emails sorry. as well. <laughs> so sorry um but yeah i was gonna say the same thing as well and yeah that was actually a good question that is a question my friend but um i i was thinking also the good thing about this is that if you wanna you know how sometimes we feel like stupid for asking questions don't feel like that but because we will collect them ahead of time there's some type of like um any like it's anonymous in a way so you can feel good asking anything you like and then we will pre-sort everything and hopefully separate them and stuff. But I th also think the leadership council, we should meet a few times or one or two times before, like by ourselves before that happens. So we can like plan everything and then 
um, we'll update the whole group about how maybe how we will do it and yeah yeah and there is no stupid question it's good to have repetition sometimes i used to be a high school teacher and, and i can promise you repet re uh, repetition is good mm -hmm. i think amanda asked on the chat what other format were also considered we did not ask uh we we were going to ask this during the meeting uh, from the other trainees uh, that what formats would be best for them because the council didn't want to make that decision on our own part. Uh, so I think from what I'm hearing uh, from the other people, I think we'll start with a, a document and I like uh, Vivian's suggestion that maybe it should be anonymous because in this way, somebody doesn't feel that they're asking a question and that it's probably targeted towards them and they have repercussions for asking that specific question. Uh, so, yeah, so that so that is that is our consideration right now. Unless uh, I mean, if you have any other suggestions or every, anybody else that has suggestions, feel free to offer that to us. Uh, I went to a fun networking event one time where um, I d I think panels can feel a little bit stale or like very formal and can be hard to get a very candid response in that setting sometimes. Um, so another thing that I have liked in the past. Panels are great, don't get me wrong, but another format is like a uh, like a speed conversation. I don't want to call it speed dating because that's not what we're doing, but like um, where you're paired with a faculty member and you like rotate both directions so that everybody gets a little bit of one on one time with each faculty member. And that way, you know, you can ask anything at all, but uh, it's a more casual environment. Um, but if I, I was just curious if you had considered anything other than a panel. If I want to jump in in there, so we have been secretly planning that for the lunch session for the guys to combine faculties with different and have a seating arrangement that everybody can have a chat because I don't like to see like one table with all training, one table with faculties. So I, won't, I didn't want you to share it, but now I shared it. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, you guys just reminded me also, we can, I mean, always integrate some type of interactive into the um, whole panel discussion. It doesn't have to be like a formal, like they all sit in one side and we sit in another. It could be like a room mixed in. They just, we just ask and then they answer. But we can always have something like, um, uh, I forgot how, what this is called, but like the word bubble things that people put in the background. We can have like questions that are not so serious. I may be like, uh, how am I feeling about my PhD? And it's like, I'm stressed, I'm scared, please. And then we can like show the PI. It's like, hey guys, so this is kind of like how we're feeling right now. Can anybody please give us some light about this um, sentiment that we have? Uh, you know, like uh, we can always think about uh, little things like that just to add a little bit into it. So if you guys have any other suggestions, please let us know because those are good because we're still, yeah, we're still more drafting. Yeah. yeah, we can make it more casual, you know, like we don't have to do like super serious. But, you know, obviously there are serious things that we do want to talk about, uh, but we can like mix it in, you know. Yeah, if you guys look at the program agenda or not, I don't know, but there are heavy kind of research discussion. I would strongly encourage you to use the time to benefit to yourself. Like you cannot answer something like directly, just have a question in there, somebody will answer that. Because research can be definitely discussed for one and a half days. Because I, being me, PhD student, I didn't have this kind of opportunity at all. So get this opportunity as a kind of, to ask a question that you cannot answer directly from your supervisor, if I say that. But if we had it like switched around in like the last five minutes, we gave uh, like the PIs a chance to ask us questions for like feedback or just, no. That's great. <laughs> I will let that. We can take it a step farther and make up a game at the end and just have the two groups compete now. But, but um, yes, that's actually a very nice idea. And maybe a game, but yeah. <laughs>
uh, maybe we can have something kind of fun games during the dinner. We gathering for the social dinner. So if you guys have plans for the fun games, let me know. Then I will arrange. Then I will can find the stuff that you guys need. Ask Vivian. She has amazing games that can be played on the phone, and that will completely, I think, change the climate of everyone going from probably very inappropriate, but that's perfect because we'll be outside of the professional <laughs> time. So Vivian has good stuff. <laughs> please share, please share. I was also gonna say, um, I know I and my supervisor, Anna, will be there and we have the government science perspective. That's kind of different from other academic faculty that you might interact with. So you might consider questions in that realm um, and we both interact with a lot of um, like biotech type folks. Um, so that's another like totally different kind of uh, career path. So don't, um, I encourage you to broaden your kinds of questions. And also we have another um, fringy also work with the pro like researchers in private institutions. So you can get some sort of feedback if you're interested in that side from fringy. So another our research committee member. Anything else? We are running a little bit late, but I apologize for that. But if you have any suggestion of anything, just share with me or the leadership council. I think it's easier to share with me than I will share with the everyone. Or someone can start a Google Drive and share with everyone, like Google Doc. Then everyone can add. Yeah, I, I can do that after the, but Tanya, I don't have the list of all the trainees. So can I share that with you and you can share that on your own? Uh, if you go to the team folder, there is a roster, then there is uh, all names, but I will share with you as access sheet just for okay. easy for your purpose. Okay. Okay, so what I understand is action point is uh, Marine will send the Google Doc drive link to the every trainee and trainee will add the questions. I would highly encourage you to add the question before Monday because our leadership council members planning to meet with the executive committee on Tuesday. Then they have kind of good idea what kind of uh, discussion they would like to have because otherwise we, they will be in trouble. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm sorry. I have one more thing to add. Just real quick. Um, shameless plug. I run the Twitter for BPRI. Please, if you guys have any pictures of your lab or of a random locust doing random things, um, anything fun or whatever you want, let me know. And Adelia, she runs Same the Instagram. The Instagram. Yeah. Please, we need content. Um, so yeah, hit us up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for everyone joining. So if you have any question, please feel free to uh, tell me. And also before you leave, please go to Padlet and uh, vote for the how, uh, checking how we are doing today meeting, one to five, just thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> then I can have the, that data for the evaluation. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you very much. So, uh, question, Tanya. Sorry, mm -hmm. is it how we are doing in life or how this meeting went? Because it's not yeah. the same. Ha, ha. Yeah, <laughs> how we are doing in this meeting. So, like, okay. I'm evaluating each training meeting. So, so far, there's <laughs> no any good response. Unfortunately, today I hope it will be better. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay.